Let me be very frank here and give you a controversial example. Very frank. The issue of the Sahaba, companions of the Prophet We all know that there are two major positions in our history. Some schools in Islam say that the Sahaba are righteous people, good people. They're the best generation after the Prophets. And they love the Sahaba and they consider it as a part of their religion to love the Sahaba. We understand other groups disagree and they say that the Sahaba disobeyed or they did or did this or they did that and they consider it a part of their religion to believe that many of the Sahaba, most of them, many of them, they went astray and they did not obey the Prophet ﷺ. Now, what is to be done about this? It's a very frank example. What is to be done? Firstly, there is no point in ignoring this elephant in the room. There is no point pretending it doesn't exist. The fact of the matter is, this is a very passionate issue for both sides of the coin. It's a very passionate issue. And I applaud the courage of Isna to be so frank as to allow us to speak about this issue in his public platform. Only by having the courage to begin the conversation can we begin the process of moving forward. So there's no point ignoring it. We do need to talk about it. Secondly, we can all agree that no matter what theological position we hold Islam, the Quran, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam never sanctioned physical violence against someone of an opposing view or theology. Let me be as explicit as possible. I am a Sunni and I'm passionate about being a Sunni. I am a theologian and my expertise is Islamic theology. So I teach and I preach and I believe Sunni theology. I might disagree with Shi'ism and with Shi'i theology, yet I will not and I cannot allow any Sunni to physically harm a Shi'i or to blow up a Shi'i masjid or shrine. No matter how passionate I am about my theology, I have to speak out against anybody who tries to force that theology upon somebody else, who wishes to force by the stick, by the sword, by the bomb, that theology. Believe what you want to believe, Argue what you want to argue, but allow the freedom of somebody else to believe as they want to believe. Thirdly, brothers and sisters, what this means, what this means is that preachers, clerics, ulama, ayatullahs, scholars of all stripes need to understand that there is a time, a place, an audience, a language, and a, 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 mo, a, and a methodology to talk about controversial issues. There's a time, a place, an audience, a language, and a methodology. Scholars and clerics need to understand that many times, even if they don't preach violence, by fanning the fuel of hatred, by being stereotypical, by using inflammatory knowledge, by generalizing, by smearing, they might not pull the trigger. They might not have the gun in their hands, but their followers, the people below them, the people who look up to them, they will be inspired to go and kill. So scholars and clerics need to own up and scholars and clerics need to understand their responsibility is more than just preaching the truth. It is tempering the truth with wisdom. And brothers and sisters, let me be very explicit here. I myself have learned from my mistakes. Two decades ago, I as well gave inflammatory lectures and speeches. I said things that still haunt me to this day. It was a younger version. I can excuse myself that I was 20, 21 years old, but it doesn't change the fact I made mistakes and I smeared and I used inflammatory language that I myself now regret and I wish I could take back. And the point being, brothers and sisters, all clerics of all stripes, they need to understand, yes, Preach what you want to preach, but do not preach a hatred. Do not preach a violence. Do not preach anything that will cause any one of your followers or people who look up to you to possibly bring about any type of physical harm on anyone else. Fourthly, and I have inshallah two minutes left and I'm finished. Fourthly, those who do feel passionately about their theologies, and I am one of them, I am a theologian, we need to understand that Islam not only allows, it commands us, it commands us to cooperate with anyone of any background when it comes to something positive and good into society. Cooperate with everybody when it comes to righteousness and taqwa. 
and don't cooperate when it comes to evil and when it comes to transgression. So, no matter how ultra-conservative you are, no matter how strict your theology is, no matter what your background, all of us need to understand that there are what I call circles of cooperation. Some areas, some arenas where we should, where we must cooperate with others. Just because we cooperate with other groups in one arena, it doesn't mean we have to cooperate in all arenas. We should be broad-minded enough and tolerant enough to make this distinction. So for example, for example, in some circumstances, I'll tell you the example of my own uh, father back in Houston, Texas. He came in 1963. And he tells us that back in the 60s and 70s, the Muslims had no luxury to start name-calling and dividing. Sunnis, Shias, Barelvis, Sufis, Ahli Hadith, they all came together to build the first masjid in Houston. Why? Because if at that stage, two people were this group, three people were that group, no masjid is going to be built. You need the cooperation of everybody. At that time, at that place, the Muslims were wise and mature enough to realize we all need to come together. What happened? Well, with the influx of immigrants in the 70s and then early 80s, when so many other people came, the two communities, Sunni and Shia, had a happy disagreement that let's each let each other go our way. This is better for our both communities. And so there was a, a nice parting of ways. You go your way, we go our way. And this parting was appropriate at that time. However, when there's a crisis, when the state wants to ban the Sharia, when the government issues something about all Muslims, Sunni, Shia, all of us, we need to come together and we need to have a united stand. Just because, just because we disagree with them in one issue, just because they have a separate masjid, okay? Alhamdulillah, let them have a separate masjid. Let us have a separate masjid. For those who want to have, for those who want to pray together, let them go one week here, one week there. We're not saying anything. But for those who want to have separate masjid, they need to be broad-minded enough, tolerant enough to understand that there's a time and a place to join hands. There's a time and a place to show unity. There's a time and a place to ignore all of those differences. And when we stand together to ignore those differences, it doesn't mean we think those differences are trivial. It means we're wise enough to see the forest from the trees, to see the broad picture from the mind you share. And, and over here, I think a perfect example to conclude with is the example of a figure that Sunnis and Shias both revere, and that is Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The famous Ali ibn Abi Talib, the, 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 the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu the son-in-law of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we all look up to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. There is an example in his life that wallahi it is amazing for us in our time. We're talking about an Islamic caliphate. We're talking about a time he could have snapped his fingers and said, do this and do that and everybody would have executed his command. What happened? The first sect was broken away from the Ummah. That sect is called the Khawarij, the Kharijites. And they were a troublesome sect. They had some strange beliefs. What did, what did Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu do? Did he say, I don't care, you can believe as you believe? No, he was a Muslim. Obviously, he loved his theology. What did he do? He sent Ibn Abbas, the theologian, the preacher, the scholar. He sent Ibn Abbas dialogue, debate, try to preach to them, convince them that they're not correct in this belief of theirs. Ibn Abbas went, he held a public debate. Guess what? One third of them returned back to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Two thirds remained. One third said, you know, this is correct, we're right. So they turned back. Now what happened to the remaining two thirds? Listen to this, O oh, Muslims, all of you listen. What did Ali ibn Abi Talib say to the remaining two thirds? He sent an emissary to them and he said, if you decide to stay upon your theology, we have no right to force you otherwise. That's your business. We try to preach to you. We don't agree with this theology of the Kharijites. We don't agree with it. But if you wish to continue, then as long as you don't harm us, we won't harm you. As long as you don't harm the Muslims, we're not going to harm you or let anybody harm you. And this philosophy of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an, we need to imbibe it and replicate it. 
Yes, I might disagree with many theologies, but it's not my right to force my theology on other people. Brothers and sisters, these differences have been with the ummah for a thousand, a thousand two hundred, a thousand four hundred years. Do you think that our hatred together will eliminate this? No. We're going to have this. Let's be pragmatic. Let's be realistic. These schisms, these sects will remain no matter what we want. So let's try to do something that we all agree to and that is to make the world a better place. Let Allah be the judge. Let Allah be the judge. In this dunya, we can all agree that we, know we shouldn't be killing one another, harming one another, physically being threatening to one another. This is not the role of any Muslim. Finally, brothers and sisters, finally, reminder to myself and all of you, we should always be careful of the greatest sin that we are in danger of committing when we talk about sectarianism, and that is the sin of arrogance. The sin of arrogance. Sure. I might believe that my theology is right, but let that not translate into believing that I, am a, as a person, am better than somebody else as a person who disagrees with my theology. The theology might be right. I am not perfect. I am not perfect. And we make a distinction between belief and between the person. Perhaps I have a sin. Perhaps my sin is arrogance. And that arrogance means I think I'm better than you because I have a different theology. Brothers and sisters, if I believe I'm upon the truth, if you believe you're upon the truth, the both of us should follow the Quranic principle best embodied by the Prophet wasallam, of truth leading to humility, truth leading to humbleness, truth leading to a lack of arrogance to those who might be upon the incorrect faith system. Brothers and sisters, no matter what we believe, we can and we should all believe in that golden rule, the rule that our Prophet wasallam, taught that Jesus Christ himself taught, that every single prophet taught, and that is that we should treat others as we ourselves want to be treated. That is the general rule. That is the rule of mercy and compassion. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger want for all of us. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.